Welcome to WXTV. We're here to take a peek inside the world of weatherization. In this episode, we'll look at where weatherization started and how far it's come in 30 years. Next, we'll get DOE's perspective on where weatherization is today. It's done differently all over the country and we want to showcase those differences. But pulling everything together is a common set of skills. We've flown in an expert on the subject. You'll be hearing from Kelly. She works hand in hand with the Department of Energy developing this set of skills that's used nationwide. And for those of you who are still in the dark about what weatherization is, we're going to follow a typical job from where money comes into the state all the way through to a follow-up with the client. Weatherization started soon after the first oil embargo of the early 70s. The first generation of providers emphasized emergency and temporary measures like caulking and weather stripping windows and doors and covering windows with plastic. As providers gained experience, they also gained a better understanding of some of the fundamentals of building science. There was much more of a push to analyze the cost effectiveness of different energy efficiency measures and weatherization incorporated more and different types of measures. Soon weatherization migrated toward more permanent measures because the cost to benefit ratio was naturally higher than the temporary ones. Crews turned to measures like installing storm windows and doors and insulating attics. In the mid-80s, the Department of Energy recognized the need and benefit for improvements to appliances like heating systems and water heaters. States were now allowed to fund improvements to these systems with weatherization funds, and within a year, DOE allowed funds to be used for the complete replacement of defective furnaces and boilers. The trend toward more cost-effective measures continued with the development and adoption of advanced home energy audits. This required a comprehensive analysis of every home before work began. Floridors provided information that could be entered into a computer for analysis. Weatherization professionals began to use audit software to assess the needs of the dwelling. The software helps them calculate where measures are required and the best approach to take. Advanced audits like this are now used in 37 states and this custom analysis has become the hallmark of weatherization, ensuring each client receives the most cost-effective treatment. By 1996, the weatherization program's performance had improved significantly. In spite of funding reductions, technical advances produced 80% higher energy savings per dwelling than had been achieved in 1989. Increases in energy savings were achieved through improving training, audit tools, and management practices with little increase in cost. Now with increased flexibility, better methods for choosing measures, and advanced diagnostics, the weatherization assistance program installs the most cost-effective improvements tailored to the needs of dwellings in all climates. Weatherization turned a corner. Technologies have improved. An auditor can now walk into a building with a clear idea of how to evaluate that building as a system and they can pass that information on to the installers who now need to know a bit about building science and materials. It's a whole new set of skills and the Department of Energy has compiled those skills into what they call the core competencies. Now we have Kelly here from DC who's going to talk a bit about the core competencies and where they might fit into your weatherization program. Now in the, in the current situation with more money flowing into the weatherization assistance program, first with the Recovery Act funding and who knows what might happen in the future with carbon trading or carbon markets. With more money in the program, there's also a lot more interest and a lot more oversight to make sure that quality measures are being installed and that they're cost effective. So there's been a little more of a push to standardize training or at least standardize the list of skill sets that are expected of these different installers, auditors, monitors, the different positions. The core competencies are a list of skills that are required to perform different jobs within the world of weatherization. A group of trainers in the weatherization network, these include trainers at state organizations, uh, private trainers, consultants, they all got together and formed this group that we call the Trainers Consortium and they basically took what is general knowledge of what is required by each of these positions 
and just wrote it down, kind of codified it. It's meant to be a tool. The trainers consortium thought that drafting a list of core competencies would increase awareness of the specialized knowledge and skills that are required to run an effective weatherization program. Say you're writing a job description for an opening at your local community action agency. You need to hire an installer and you can go to the core competencies and there are the skills already listed out for you. Say you want to assess your crew when it's time for promotions or raises. That might be another use of the core competencies or if you want to apply for one of these jobs. For example, an installer to go out and install cost-effective weatherization measures on a home safely and effectively needs to know the different materials that are used for the job. They need to know the different air sealing materials and when those are best used in the different situations. They need to know the different insulations and where those are best applied, how to install them. For example, we do a lot of dense pack sidewall insulation. A lot of installers use blown-in cellulose, so they need to know not only how to install that into the wall and get the proper density to get the air tightness and the R value that we want, but also how to maintain the blower machine that we use and how to calibrate the pressure on the hose to make sure that it's blowing strong enough. So there are a whole level of specialized skills, and part of the core competencies, the idea of them is also to draw attention to these specialized skills. You know, we aren't just sending out, uh, sending out some folks in a truck to come into your home and, and mess around. They really have a skill set and it makes them the right people for that job. The core competencies are also really useful for trainers because they provide a framework for them to use when they're developing a course. If I want to design a training for weatherization installers, I can go to the core competencies, see what skills they need, what knowledge they need, and then develop a curriculum that addresses all of those skills and knowledge. DOE doesn't require any specific type of training. They don't require any certain standardized training, but they expect that work installed out in the field meets a certain standard. DOE has started a project just this year, or last year, in 2009 we started, developing a standardized curriculum for those training centers or for trainers out there that don't already have a curriculum. Maybe they don't already have presentations and notes and uh, classroom exercises. They can just take this standardized curriculum that's being developed using the core competencies as the framework. They can take that off the shelf already done and deliver it and know that at the end they've laid the groundwork for these installers or whatever position the training is for. The standardized curriculum is one way to deliver a training that will provide that kind of standard out in the field. If trainers already have a training that they enjoy delivering, they can continue using that. They can take from the standardized curriculum and intersperse the presentations. Traditionally, training has been kind of a mixed bag in the weatherization network. The way the funds come into the system is the Department of Energy on the federal level passes it down to the states. We call them the grantees and also includes territories and tribal organizations. And then those grantees pass the money to local agencies called community action agencies. And the federal government has known since the beginning of weatherization that things work differently in different regions. There are different measures that would be cost effective. There are different training mechanisms that work better. So they haven't tried to be too regulatory in that respect. 